first, though, we want to get to Southern California on alert this morning after getting hit by the largest earthquake there in two decades. The San Andreas Fault, often known as California's sleeping giant, defines the dangerous but undeniable barrier between two of Earth's tectonic plates. It's responsible for the most powerful earthquakes ever occurring in California, magnitudes as high as 8.1. Geologists and other experts are concerned about when the next big one may strike, since this recognizable fault line has been linked to some of the worst earthquakes in recorded history. In today's video, we'll uncover the truth behind the San Andreas Fault, a geological wonder that still fascinates and terrifies us. We'll discover the facts and mysteries underlying this geological phenomenon, so stay tuned. I, it continues it, it, this is to, a very strong to rattle earthquake. pretty strong here. 821 here on the air. We're experiencing very strong shaking. Wow. I think we need to get under the deck. Let's start with how the San Andreas Fault formed. At the end of the Paleozoic period and the Triassic period's end, the landmass known as North America was connected to the landmasses known as Africa, South America, and Europe. Pangaea was the name of the single continent that included them all. As a three-pronged fracture emerged between Africa, South America, and North America, it was the first sign that Pangaea was beginning to be ripped apart. Magma began to rise through a crack in the crust, which led to a rift zone dominated by volcanoes. When these landmass fragments of Pangaea began to break apart, the terrain was ravaged by volcanic eruptions that spread ash and other volcanic debris throughout the region. The rift that formed due to the continent's steady drift away eventually gave rise to a new ocean basin known as the Atlantic. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge Rift Zone continues to supply raw volcanic materials to the growing ocean basin. At this time, North America has gradually moved away from the rift zone and towards the west. The massive continental crust to become the new east coast broke into a sequence of down-dropped fault blocks nearly parallel to the shoreline. At first, the edge of the hot and faulted continent was elevated and buoyant about the newly formed ocean basin. When the edge of North America moved away from the hot rift zone, the temperature on that portion of the continent started dropping and it began to descend beneath the new Atlantic Ocean. This divergent plate boundary used to be active, but now it's the trailing edge of the westward advancing North American continent. The Atlantic Plain is a classic example of a passive continental margin when discussing plate tectonics. As a result of these tectonic movements around 30 million years ago, the North American plate swallowed up virtually all of the Farallon plate, which led to the formation of the San Andreas Fault Line. And since then, the North American plate has been pressed up against the Pacific plate at a border that is known as a strike-slip fault. As viewed from above, the San Andreas Fault is a long, narrow valley along the border between the North American and Pacific plates. This thin gap between the two plates is referred to as a fault. When examined more closely, however, one can see that several fractures and fault mark the zone where the two plates slide past one another. There are times when the border is a zone that contains numerous minor faults, any one or more of which might rupture during an earthquake. Why is the San Andreas Fault important? This fault is one of the most significant faults in the world and stretches over 800 miles between the Salton Sea and Cape Mendocino making it one of the most critical faults in the world. It creates a division across the state. The Pacific Plate is in San Diego, Los Angeles, and Big Sur. On the north, American Plate lies the cities of San Francisco and Sacramento, as well as the Sierra Nevada mountains. Numerous active and passive earthquake faults cut through each of the plates to make up the earth. The San Andreas Fault runs deep near and beneath some of California's most densely populated regions. On the San Andreas Fault Line, you'll find the cities of San Bernardino, Desert Hot Springs, Wrightwood, Palmdale, Daly City, Point Reyes Station, and Bodega Bay. Other cities along the fault include Fraser Park and Gorman. Los Angeles County is separated by the Southern San Andreas Fault, parallel to the San Gabriel Mountains' northern flank. It can trigger severe earthquakes with a magnitude as high as eight, which would impact high population communities in Southern California. One example of a transform fault is the San Andreas Fault, Imagine placing two slices of pizza on the table and moving them past one another until they meet along the shared edge of the pie. The pepperoni from one side begins to fall over the border onto the anchovy side as it crumbles. The same thing occurs with the fault. The geology and landscapes along the huge rift are exceedingly complicated. The plates are inching closer to each other at the rate of a few inches each year, roughly equivalent to the speed at which your fingernails grow. Yet, this is not a constant motion. Instead, it's an average motion. When the plates press against one another, they will remain locked for many years without making any movement. 
The pressure building up along the fault suddenly caused the rock to shatter, and as a result, the plates moved many feet in one swift motion. The fracturing of the stone causes waves to spread in all directions, resulting in the waves that people experience being earthquakes. However, the last significant earthquake to hit the southern San Andreas Fault was in 1857, when a magnitude 7.9 earthquake ruptured in an incredible 185 miles between Monterey County and the San Gabriel Mountains near Los Angeles. This was the last time Southern California was affected by a major earthquake on this fault. Thomas Jordan, the director of the Southern California Earthquake Center, commented that there had been a tranquil period since then. Also, according to Thomas Jordan, the Southern California portion of the San Andreas Fault is locked, loaded, and ready to go. On top of that, other parts of the San Andreas Fault have a long way to go before they produce a significant earthquake. Farther to the southeast of Cajon Pass, San Bernardino County, the spot has mostly stayed the same since an earthquake occurred in 1812. Moving southeast into the Salton Sea, the fault has been relatively calm from around 1680 to 1690. According to what scientists have observed based on the movement of tectonic plates, with the Pacific Plate moving northwest of the North American Plate, earthquakes should relieve about 16 feet of accumulated plate movement every 100 years. The San Andreas Fault has not reduced the stress building up for over 100 years. According to Jordan, it's critical for California to primarily emphasize protecting its infrastructure against the possibility of a devastating earthquake of magnitude 8. He welcomed the plan pushed into law by Mayor Eric Garcetti of Los Angeles to mandate seismic retrofits on apartment complexes and concrete structures. Jordan said that the occurrence of this event was quite astonishing. We're aware of how challenging it may be politically to implement reforms of this nature. Additional areas of effort have included fortifying Los Angeles's fragile aqueduct system and telecommunications networks. According to the United States Geological Survey, in 2008, a magnitude 7.8 earthquake on the San Andreas Fault would result in over 1,800 fatalities, 50,000 injuries, $200 billion in damages, and severe disruptions that would last for a significant amount of time. One of the concerns that are anticipated is that the sewage system may be inoperable for a period of half a year. An earthquake of this magnitude could cause the ground to shake for almost two minutes, with the Coachella Valley, Inland Empire, and Antelope Valley experiencing the most intense shaking. However, the earthquake could also send pockets of severe shaking into areas where sediments trap bouncing waves, such as the San Gabriel Valley and East Los Angeles. An earthquake that occurred in 1857 was believed to have a magnitude of 7.9, bringing to light the potentially destructive nature of the fault. The earthquake is known as the Fort Tejon Quake. It began much further north, well up in Parkfield in Monterey County, which is why the name is a misconception. The earthquake continued to move south along the San Andreas Fault for another 185 miles, moving past Fort Tejon on the northern boundary of the Los Angeles County, then heading east towards the Cahoon Pass in San Bernardino County, close to where the 15 freeway is located today. The earthquake was so severe that the ground melted, which led to the collapse of trees even far away as Stockton. In addition, trees were uprooted to the west of Fort Tejon. The earthquake lasted anywhere from one to three minutes. Even though the San Andreas Fault does not run directly into Los Angeles, it is 30 miles distance from downtown, the city is likely to be significantly affected by a massive earthquake that occurs on that fault. For instance, Jordan noted that models of a probable magnitude 7.8 earthquake on the San Andreas Fault that originates at the Salton Sea and travels west towards the San Gabriel Mountains show seismic shaking waves curved towards the Los Angeles area. This is because the fault begins at the Salton Sea. A video shows the ground shaking firmly from the northern part of San Diego County down to Barstow. Using that time's most powerful supercomputer in the world, the Southern California Earthquake Center in 2010 unveiled the simulation of an earthquake of magnitude 8 that begins in Monterey County, similar to the one that occurred in 1857, but then moves even further south in the direction of the Mexican border. Both San Fernando Valley and Los Angeles would take significant damage due to the shaking that the fragile soils would confine in both areas. According to Jordan, one can see that this sphere of effect caused by the earthquake has now stretched out to enormous dimensions. You see that large directivity pulse out in front. When that energy is being driven down that fault, that directivity pulse drives energy into seismic waves that excite the sedimentary basins, including the San Fernando Valley and the Los Angeles and into San Bernardino, Jordan said. He also warned that you'd observe significant shaking in Los Angeles region lasting for lengthy periods, and you shouldn't be alarmed by this. Geology of the San Andreas Fault 
According to the theory of plate tectonics, the San Andreas Fault transforms the boundary between two major tectonic plates of the Earth's crust, the Northern Pacific Plate to the south and west, and the Northern American Plate to the east and north. The San Andreas Fault separates these plates. The San Andreas Fault is a strike-slip defect because the Northern Pacific Plate is sliding laterally across the North American Plate while moving in a northerly direction. During the geologic time, the plate's relative movement averages around 1 centimeter annually, even though the yearly activity rate has increased to 4 and 6 centimeters since the early 20th century. During the earthquake that occurred in 1906, certain sections of the fault line shifted as much as 6.4 meters. The fault may be seen as a series of scarps and pressure ridges in numerous locations, such as the Carrizo Plain in San Luis Obispo County and the Olima Trough in Marin County. Both of these areas are in California, and in certain areas, the fault has stayed the same for a considerable amount of time, and as a result, it's observed by alluvium and overgrown with bush. This makes the fault's presence more challenging to detect. Several highways along the fault in San Bernardino and Los Angeles counties pass through large mountains covered in gouge, a powdery, crumbly rock that the moving plates have crushed. The San Andreas Fault may be identified by the diverse rock formations that can be seen on each side of the fault. Due to the passage of time over the past 30 million years, rocks from many different locations and origins have become interlinked with stones from very long ranges. Some people believe that the selenium block of granite that may be found in central and northern California originated in southern California, while others believe it came from northern Mexico. The Ninach Volcanics is located approximately 200 miles to the southeast in Los Angeles County. At the same time, Pinnacles National Monument in Monterey County is only part of a volcanic complex that is now protected as a national monument. The myth about megaquakes. The San Andreas Fault is the topic of several urban legends and myths, the most popular of which claims that the fault will eventually break and cause the state of California to sink into the ocean. That's a misconception. It's not going to happen, and it's not even possible. There is no such thing as an earthquake weather or specific times of the day when earthquakes are much more likely to happen. The ability to accurately anticipate earthquakes has been called the holy grail of seismology on more than one occasion. However, if it were ever established, it would give rise to many significant challenges. Firstly, earthquakes are infrequent, meaning any early approaches will always have a degree of inaccuracy. Who will decide to carry out activities that meet all needs, such as evacuating an entire city or region? How long should people remain away from the area if a quake doesn't occur? How often must this happen before people stop taking the warning seriously and it becomes the case of the boy who cried wolf? How do authorities compromise between the recognized dangers posed by the mayhem of a mass evacuation and the risk posed by the shaking itself? It is a delusion to think that prediction technology will emerge fully complete and dependable in the future. In seismology, there's a common saying that earthquakes are not responsible for people's deaths. Instead, the buildings are destroyed. And as of right now, scientists are already good enough at predicting earthquake danger and that the best course of action is to increase efforts to construct or retrofit buildings, bridges, and other infrastructure so that they're safe and resilient if the ground shakes in any risky region from large future earthquakes. At least until further notice, these measures will pay off in terms of lives and property saved much more than any anticipated earthquake prediction method. However, research on earthquake prediction is still ongoing, and scientists have recently estimated that over the next 30 years, the likelihood of a major earthquake occurring in Los Angeles is 60% that of an earthquake measuring magnitude 6.7, 46% that an earthquake measuring magnitude 7, and 31% that an earthquake measuring magnitude 7.5. In the San Francisco Bay Area, there's a possibility of 72% that an earthquake measuring a magnitude 6.7 will occur in the San Francisco Bay region, along with 51% that an earthquake will occur measuring magnitude 7, and 20% that an earthquake will occur measuring magnitude 7.5. There is a correlation between the ground fault on which an earthquake happens and its magnitude. This indicates that the size and intensity of a quake will increase proportionally with the length of the mark. At this point, the length of the San Andreas Fault is only 880 miles. It would take the rupture of a fault far longer than the San Andreas Fault to produce an earthquake of magnitude 10. No known faults are long enough to produce an earthquake of magnitude 10, and there have never been. On May 22, 1960, Chile had a magnitude 9.5 earthquake, the strongest earthquake ever recorded. The quake took place on a fault extending for about 1,000 kilometers. Based on the geology, USGS experts can predict the ground motion in the history of seismic activity recorded in the area. These site response models are utilized by the engineers who draft building codes to improve the overall safety of buildings. The San Andreas Fault is more likely to cause significant earthquakes than smaller ones, but it still poses a considerable threat. 
Because of the state's large population and calm environment, California is home to more people living below the poverty line than any other state or country. Along the line of the fault, there are various roadways. They're not overrun with people, so one can enjoy the serenity while taking the kids out. There is sufficient space for camping, bird watching, rock collection, and enjoying the area's natural beauty, including wildlife and wildflowers. Future of the San Andreas Fault This world-famous fault continues to astonish scientists and geologists because of its total silence, and they have no clue when it will release all of the shaped pressure it's been keeping in. If another earthquake were to come from the San Andreas Fault, would it be as powerful as the one in 1857 near Tejon? Or would it be as great as the 1906 San Francisco earthquake? The San Francisco earthquake was a giant earthquake that occurred off the coast of Northern California at 5.12 in the morning on April 18, 1906. It had a magnitude of 7.9. The shaking was felt from Coos Bay, Oregon in the north to Los Angeles, California in the south. The earthquake caused significant damage in San Francisco and nearby cities like San Jose, Salinas, and Santa Rosa. After the earthquake, a major fire broke out that quickly spread to the neighborhoods of Russian Hill, Chinatown, North Beach, and Telegraph Hill. It started in the commercial zone near Montgomery Street and south of the Market District. The fire burned for four days until the burning ashes it left behind were finally removed by the rainfall. During the event, more than 500 blocks in the city center were demolished, corresponding to around 10 square kilometers. The fire destroyed around 28,000 buildings, and the total worth of these properties were estimated to be $350 million. The great earthquake that occurred at Fort Tejon on January 9, 1857, was the second largest earthquake ever recorded in the continental United States. Along the San Andreas Fault, it produced an incredible surface rupture scar over 220 miles. Its magnitude on the Richter scale was estimated to be between 7.9 and 8.0. This would classify it as a great quake, which in densely populated regions causes a significant amount of property damage and loss of life. However, despite the deadly force of this monster, only two individuals have lost their lives due to the incident. A lady was killed when an adobe home collapsed at Reed's Ranch, close to Fort Tejon. A senior citizen had been found deceased in the greater Los Angeles region. In 1857, the population of Southern California was relatively low, especially in the areas most severely affected by the earthquake. Because of this fact and some good luck, the number of those who perished was relatively low. Despite this, the earthquake's after effects were highly spectacular, and some people even found them terrifying. The fire reached as far as Santa Cruz and burned property there. The United States Geological Survey modeled a 7.8 magnitude earthquake with a slippage of 2 to 7 meters to understand the effects of a large southern San Andreas earthquake. This event represented the stresses that had been built up in the region since the last time there was a significant event there. Based on this model, it was discovered that the construction straddling the fault was sustained the most damage. After the passing of the Alquist Priola Earthquake Fault Zoning Act in 1972, fortunately, structures of this kind have become exceedingly uncommon. However, this slippage would affect the 966 roads, 90 fiber optic cables, 39 gas pipes, and 141 electrical lines that span the fault zone. It was thought that the overall cost of damage to structures was $33 billion, with newer buildings doing much better than older ones, but being highly sensitive to destruction. Once gas mains and water pipelines are broken, flames will break out, just as they did after the Northridge earthquake. The damage from the fires that broke out due to the shaking is anticipated to be more expensive than the damage caused by the shaking itself. The estimated death toll across the country is 1,800, and when things can't get much worse, the major event will have disrupted the region's tectonics to such an extent that a series of aftershocks that have the potential to be quite powerful will begin. For example, Christchurch, New Zealand was hit by an earthquake of a 6.2 magnitude in 2011, and ever since then, the city and the region around it have suffered more than 10,000 aftershocks combined. How to protect yourself during an earthquake Homeowners can assist themselves and make efforts on an individual level to improve the ability of populated places to survive an earthquake of catastrophic scale. In a significant quake, they can strengthen their homes and businesses to be more durable. Fire extinguishers must be deployed in every single public space, if it's possible in a variety of settings, including houses and automobiles. Also, they must be included in the earthquake kits. Putting out small fires before they have a chance to spread and become more deadly may save a lot of lives, property, and money. Shakeout drills can be held in any setting, including residential areas, companies, and schools. It's also essential to not give credence to too many earthquake urban legends and to avoid constant fear. Geological studies have shown that even in a catastrophic earthquake, 
California will not separate from the United States, nor will it slip into the ocean. Most overly dramatic depictions of the apocalypse in popular literature are exaggerations. Every person will be responsible for their safety during an earthquake and must take the necessary precautions. If you're driving, stop and pull over. Put the parking brake on. And if you're in bed, lie face down and use a pillow to support your neck and head. Stay away from buildings if you're outside. If you're inside, don't run outdoors and remain away from doorways. You can follow these three words, drop, cover, and hold. Wherever you are, go on your hands and knees and grab onto anything solid for support. And be sure that the wheels of your wheelchair or walker with a seat are secured and remain seated until the shaking stops. It would be best to drape your arms over your head and neck. If a substantial table or desk is nearby, you can seek cover by crawling underneath it. If there is nowhere to take shelter nearby, you should crawl next to an internal wall away from windows. Crawl only if you cannot reach more excellent cover by moving through a region with more debris without doing so. Maintain a kneeling or crouching position to protect your vital organs. If you are positioned below a desk or table, keep one hand on it and be prepared to move along if it shifts. If you are seated and unable to descend to the ground, you should stoop forward, cover your head with your arms, and keep both hands on your neck. Finally, if a shock of a magnitude of that one that occurred at Fort Tejone were to happen today, the damage cost would easily reach the billions of dollars. There would certainly be a significant number of fatalities. Wrightwood, Palmdale, Fraser Park, and Taft are modern-day settlements that may be found on or close to the 1857 rupture region. The United States Geological Survey, USGS, now predicts a 7% possibility of an earthquake of a comparable magnitude or higher, striking the Los Angeles area during the next 30 years. The good news is that the movie San Andreas is wholly made up. It features the same amount of exaggerations that we are all familiar with seeing from filmmakers who ironically also have their offices in Southern California. Despite this, the San Andreas Fault will almost certainly produce a large earthquake at some point in the not too distant future. It is expected to do severe damage when it does come and Southern California will be significantly impacted. Yet people who live in California are used to dealing with natural disasters of this type. In recent years, the state's physical structures have been built to protect against earthquakes. You can forget about tsunamis and deep craters opening up. Still, you should be prepared for seismic events, building damage, fires, and significant economic effects because the region is unstable for an unspecified duration. Do you believe that a megaquake will happen during our lifetime? Do you prepare enough to face the aftermath of any catastrophic event? Please share your thoughts in the comments section. And if you like our video, remember, give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Turn that notification bell on for more videos like this. You can click on the thumbnails on the screen for more exciting videos just like this. Take care.